Let's look at a couple of different types of ideals. So we're going to define a prime ideal. So first of all, it has to be a proper ideal. It can't be all of R. And the whole idea is that if we take two elements of R and when we multiply them together, we get something in the ideal, then one of those two elements have to be in the ideal. Let's look at an example. Let's say I've got my commutative ring, R, our standard example. We're just going to use the integers. And I'm going to say that the ideal generated by 5 is a prime ideal. Why is that? Well, remember that the ideal generated by 5 is going to end up being basically the set of multiples of 5. And the whole idea is, if you multiply two integers and get a multiple of 5, one of those things had to be a multiple of 5. Now, of course, that doesn't work for all integers. If I took the ideal generated by 6, same kind of thing, 6n, such that n is an element of z, that's not necessarily a prime ideal, because 2 times 3 is certainly an element of that ideal, but 2 and 3, neither one of them is in there. Okay. Another ideal is a maximal ideal. A maximal ideal, again, only working with commutative rings, again, it has to be a proper ideal, can't be all of the ring. And the whole idea, though, is that if you've got an ideal that contains that maximal ideal, the only possibility is either the ideal that contains it is just the ideal itself, or it's the whole ring. There's no thing that is between the ideal and the ring. For an example, let's look at all of the ideals of Z24. We can create a subring lattice just like we did for subgroups. So Z24, it has ideals generated by 2 and 3. And again, all these things are going to be is the multiples of these things. It's just we're doing it in Z24 instead of all of Z. set of multiples of 6, that's a sub-ring of both the multiples of 2 and the multiples of 3. Set of multiples of 4 come off there, but not off of the 6. Down below these, we've got a set of multiples of 12. Over here, we've got a set of multiples of 8. And then... Off of both of those, we have just the zero ideal. Now, looking at this, just going by this thing, these two things, the ideal generated by 2, the ideal generated by 3, are both maximal ideals here. There's no ideal in between here and the entire ring. Both of these ideas, the prime ideal and the maximal ideal, can be tough to verify in general. But there are some interesting properties involving them. Let's say we have a commutative ring with unity, and we've got an ideal of the ring. Then the factor group, R over A, is an integral domain 
if and only if that ideal was a prime ideal. Okay, it's an if and only if statement, so there's two directions to prove. So, let's start and suppose r slash a is an integral domain. So we're trying to show that A is a prime ideal. If we go back to our definition of prime ideal, that means that whenever we have two elements of the ring that end up in that ideal, when we multiply them together, then one of the two things has to be in the ideal. So let's go ahead and suppose A and B are in my ring and AB is an element of that ideal A. Okay, well let's just factor ring. Suppose I have A plus A times B plus A. By definition, that's AB plus A. But wait a minute, AB is an element of A, so that thing is A. Now A is the zero element of that factor or that that factor ring. Since that's the zero and these are elements of the factor ring, we have two things in there that multiply together to give us the zero element. Since we're assuming this thing is an integral domain, that must mean that we have no zero divisors. So that must mean that either a plus a is a or b plus a is a. Since we have no zero divisors, one of those things must be the zero element. But again, that means if a plus a is the is equal to a, that must mean that a is an element of a. Or similarly over here, b is an element of a. So there we go. If a, b are an r and a, b is an element of a, when r of a was an integral domain, it must mean that one of those two things was in the ideal, which meant that a was a prime ideal. Okay. So now what about the other direction? So let's suppose that A is a prime ideal. So we need to show that R slash A is an integral domain. So we need to show that r slash a has no zero divisors. So let's say I have two elements of my factor ring. So I've got some kind of a plus a and some b plus a and I'm multiplying those together to get 0 plus a or just a. Again, it's basically the same kind of argument. a b plus a is equal to a, so a b is an element of a. But a was a prime ideal. Since a, b is an element of a, that must mean that a is an element of a or b is an element of a, because again, that's the definition of a prime ideal. And so therefore, either a plus a is the zero or b plus a is the zero. Once again, so we have two things equaling zero, meant that one of the two things had to be zero. So therefore, r slash a is an integral domain.
We've got a similar thing if we have a maximal ideal. So, if we've got a commutative ring with unity, and we've got an ideal, then the factor ring is a field, that is, it has multiplicative inverses, if and only if A is a maximal ideal. I'm not going to go through the proof for this one, but it's an important property to realize that you have.